it is flashing, and so the battery is totally dead. It's already dead. If you could, that would, if you could, that would be great. For now, let's uh, just go with this microphone here. Good evening, everyone. I am there. For those of you wondering what was happening when I uh, looked at my battery pack, it was flashing on and off, on and off. That has happened to me in the past, and it is not a pleasant thing. And so I'm glad that that happened early and did not disrupt our service halfway through, and I'm glad that I'm being heard by all of you. Today we are talking about things of great value, things that are worthy of our sacrifice and our commitment. And we're looking again at a number of different parables later on in the message portion of our time together. Parables that come from that same chapter of scripture that we looked at today or this morning, Matthew chapter 13. As I was thinking about what text to use as a call to worship, I thought of Paul's words to the Philippian church where he talks also about the kingdom of God being worthy of our sacrifice. He writes these words in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8 through 11. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, Paul writes, strong language, that I may gain Christ. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and, so, and somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. When Paul uses this image of uh, becoming like Jesus in his death and wanting to experience the power of Christ's resurrection, he is talking about the power of God's resurrection that leads to life, not inhaling and exhaling life, but, but zoe life, the kind of life that Jesus talks about when he says, I've come so that you may have life more abundantly, precious something to sacrifice, something so precious that we seek it with all of our might and we come into worship this evening 
asking that God would meet us in this time through song and prayer, asking that God would speak to us through his word, his son, Jesus Christ. As we join together this evening, let's come together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, we want to know you. We want to grow in knowledge and in depth of insight into the power of your love and the gift of your resurrection. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us through your spirit this evening. As we raise our voices in song, as we bend our knee in prayer, we ask, Lord, we plead, Lord, that you would remind us of the life that comes to each of us in you. Amen. We join together in our first hymn of gathering, The Lord is King, enthroned in might. Let's join together in singing, The Lord is King. Congregation, will you please stand to receive God's welcome? Friends, brothers and sisters in, in Jesus Christ, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit bind us together this evening and remind us again of his great love revealed in Jesus. Amen. We remain standing as we sing our first hymn of adoration, Come Worship God. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4 of Come Worship God.
congregation can please be seated. Our next hymn of praise, of adoration, is a very familiar song. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. We celebrate the goodness of God revealed in so many different ways, given to us in the love of Jesus. Let's sing together. I'm going to read for us as a part of this section of our service, God's will for our lives from the book of Luke chapter five in verses one through 11. This is the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has not yet called to himself his disciples. The beginning of his ministry, we read these words from the account of Luke. One day, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little farther from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, we've been, uh, we've been working hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. 
When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon saw this, he fell on his face. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I came across a really lovely story this past week that I want to share with you. In 1980, a statue at Christ the King Cathedral in San Diego was damaged by vandals. The hands of the statue of Jesus Christ were broken off, and when repairing the the statue, the community decided not to reattach the hands and instead placed a plaque at the base of the statue which reads, I have no hands, but yours. That quote is actually attributed to St. Teresa of Avila. In this evening's gospel reading from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, we read about how Jesus sets apart a number of men to be his disciples, he calls Simon, James, and John. Those disciples would later be commissioned by God and sent out into the world to be the hands and the feet, to be the voice of Jesus Christ. As we think about those disciples, one can't help but be struck struck by the modesty of Jesus' beginnings and who he began with. There were those modest fishermen whom he called to follow him, to be his disciples, to be his hands and feet. There was one of his disciples, Levi, or Matthew, as he came to be known, who was a a tax collector, despised by his community. He, too, was called to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. I have no hands but yours. And this is what Christ says to us as well. Like the apostles, we are called to be the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ, his voice in the world, like the apostles, and like Joseph, earlier on in the Old Testament. We may have little training, we may may have troubled pasts, even broken pasts, and yet God says to each of us, in the midst of our pasts, if we come to him in confession and repentance, you are my hands and feet, God says to us. You are my voice in a broken world. We sing together now this hymn, this song of committal, this song where we are reminded again in the lyrics, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give. We are his hands, his feet, his voice. I surrender all.
Let us read together from God's holy, uh, holy word before we do the reading from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, and verses 44 through 46. I'd like to lead in a word of prayer. Our great and gracious and good God, we come into your presence this evening humbled that you would use us as your hands, your feet, and your voice in this world. We, we barely feel up to the task. We are feeble in body, slow to speak, not very quick-witted, and yet you have called each of us broken, limited as we are into your kingdom's fold as your sheep. We pray, Lord, that again you would use us as your church. We pray, Lord, that, that the presence of your church in this community called Holland Christian Homes would be, have a leavening effect so that everything that is done in this place is shaped by your love. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us now through your word, through these words of parables spoken to us by Jesus. Lord, hear our prayer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, or 13, verses 31 through 35. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about a 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. And then later on, uh, uh, there's a few more verses. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophets. And then verse, uh, flipping over to verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went out and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and he bought it. This is the word of the Lord. One of my seminary professors, Neil Plantinga, who also became the president of the seminary, wrote a book that I have used in all of my pre-profession classes entitled, A Sure Thing. In that book, he tells the story of a pastor who was leading a Bible study, and in that Bible study, or at least the theme of that Bible study was the theme, all authority has been in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All power for this discussion of God's great power, only three people showed up. Two very old women and one trembling old man Outside the church where that lesson was being taught, Hitler's stormtroopers marched, crowds cheered, and searchlights crisscrossed. Bands and banners and salutes and marching orders all said, Hail, or Hitler is king. All hail the power of Hitler. Inside the church, two very old women and one trembling old man tried to believe instead the power of Christ. 
It must have been uphill work for everything they could hear and see said to them, there is no power but Hitler's power. Christians today sometimes struggle with a similar thought when it comes to this message on, about the kingdom of God. When we talk about the kingdom of God or its synonymous phrase, the, the, the kingdom of heaven, we are talking about the rule and reign of Jesus Christ over all things. And yet we too have a difficult time believing in that message in the face of all of the things that we see in our world. In the midst of all the glittering cocktail parties, in the, in the midst of the big university hum, the great stadiums roar, the factories belching out smoke, all the busy people in all the busy places, working and eating and finding rest and play. It's hard in the midst of that to think that Jesus Christ is king. Jesus' disciples were also worried about this as well. When are you going to usher in your kingdom, they would ask Jesus. When will you restore all things to their glory and to yourself? The disciples had their doubts. Of course, they knew that Jesus Christ had done some good things, even some amazing things. He had declared his power over sin and the gra or over, over disease by healing many who were sick. He had cast out demons. He had called them into a life of following him. But it didn't seem like enough shaping up shaping up a few ragged be be beggars that wouldn't budge the power of King Herod, they thought, healing some sick folks, befriending some prostitutes, or having a dinner with a weasel like Zacchaeus, that wouldn't shake up a man like Caesar. Looking at the Roman army, looking at the Roman tax system, looking at the arrogant power of Rome in its, its grandiosity, there was one declaration that they heard, and that was that Herod was king, that Caesar was king. For such doubts, Jesus would tell his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven, he said, is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds. As we uh, hear this parable, perhaps in our mind's imagination, we can imagine Jesus reaching out a palm, his palm, and in that palm, he holds a tiny little mustard seed, seemingly insignificant, having no consequence, small in its, in, in its consequence and in its influence in the world. And yet Jesus says, this mustard seed, if planted in the right soil, will, will grow. It will become not a mighty oak. It will become one of the most significant plants in the garden. That mustard seed will provide shade for the birds of the air. It will provide food for those birds as well. That mustard seed that can hardly be seen slowly over the months and over the years will grow into a 10-foot shrub. The kingdom of God is like that, Neil Plantinga says. It starts out small. The kingdom of, of heaven doesn't end there. It doesn't end in the small. When we think, or the emphasis in that first parable is the emphasis on small beginnings, a tiny mustard seed. And as I was reading about tiny, or as I was thinking about tiny beginnings, I, I couldn't help but think of an experience that I, that I had with one of you just a few short weeks ago in one of our coffee socials. I think it perfectly illustrates this message of how the kingdom of God grows. Sometimes out of seemingly insignificant, small beginnings, 
One of you took to the coffee social a, a card. It was the kind of card you might uh, write a recipe on. It was no fancier than that, but on that card was written some information about the gentleman who was showing me that card, and, and he told me a story. He said, in, in the 1960s, when, when people came over from Holland, there, there was no health insurance like we have today, OHIP. Instead, what we decided to do in the 1960s is, is gather together as a group of people and, and pool our monies so that those monies could be used to care for anybody who, who had a, a health crisis. It was our version in the Christian Reformed Church. That's where this man came from. It was, it was our version, our early version of OHIP, but, but that, uh, that insurance became kind of redundant, kind of useless when in, in the mid-1960s OHIP came about. And so the people who had established this insurance fund, this is a very interesting story. I think that that card should find a prominent place in Holland Christian homes. Small, it's a story of small beginnings. The man told me how when OHIP came about and insurance or the insurance that they had developed in this small group was no longer needed. There was, there was some seed monies that, uh, that uh, was used after they sold that small insurance group. And the people who had founded that decided to buy a piece of property. That property was on the corner of Steeles and McLaughlin and happened to be the property upon which Holland Christian Homes had its beginning. The story of Holland Christian Homes continues as we look at the beginning, the, the, the modest beginning of Holland Christian Homes in the, build, in, the, in, the, in the building of a modest tower in the early part of the 1970s. And again, I, I imagine that timeline, people beginning to think about how to use this property that was purchased uh, in the mid-1960s, how to, how to, to use the, the, these properties for the glory of God and the building of God's kingdom. And their imaginations began to grow. Why don't we, why don't we build a place where our seniors can be cared for into their senior years? And so it began. Early on, it was people in their freshly retirement years who would move in, but those people, as they aged, would soon need more and more health care. And so what was established in is what is now the CEO's office was a six-bed place where people returning from the hospital could come and get nursing care. Small beginnings from the nursing care program that we have here at Holland Christian Homes. I think about that story as, as the perfect metaphor for what Jesus Christ is talking about here when he talks and uses this, this parable of a mustard seed, the tiniest of all seeds that grows into a 10-foot bush. Don't despise. Small beginnings is a con pretty consistent message of Scripture, isn't it? Don't despise small beginnings is that message that we see in Jesus Christ himself when he began his life as a tiny infant in an insignificant podunk town in the city or in the little town of Bethlehem and then grew up in another insignificant podunk area of the nation of Israel in, a nation, in an area known as Galilee. I've been through that, th those, those places and every time I went through those, t the, 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 those places, every time I, I drove through the city of Bethlehem, and it, it wasn't very often, it was just on one occasion, I was there for a vacation, not a, not a vacation, a education trip. That's what I meant to say. My impression, my response, is that it? Come on. There's got to be more to it than, than that. The king of the universe arrived in a tiny podunk town. 
the king of the universe was raised in a similarly tiny town and region of Galilee. Is that it? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, the smallest of seeds. It will grow into a 10-foot bush, and it will provide comfort and support for the birds of the air. It will feed those birds. That's what the kingdom of heaven does. It provides places where other people can flourish. And it is that vision of God's kingdom that motivated men and women 50, 60 years ago to begin a place called Holland Christian Homes. It is this message, too, of the kingdom of God that, that, that really inspires me and inspired me to become a Christian reform minister. I, too, grew up in this denomination, in this church that we find, or this denomination that we find ourselves in. And I remember thoughts as a teenager, and you'll have to forgive me for these thoughts. The thoughts were, is, is this it? <laughs> you know, I was surrounded by Dutch people that I had grown up with that uh, I knew very well. I knew their foibles and their flaws, and that question is, is this it, was one of my more sarcastic, and I, by the way, I'm quite ashamed by that response. And this leads us into the next parable that Jesus Christ would give. He uses the parable, or he talks and uses the image of yeast. In the NIV, the NIV translates that, that the, the yeast was mixed through this 60 pounds of flour. But the actual word there in Greek is the yeast was hidden and worked its way through the yeast so that it had a leavening effect on the whole batch. That message of, of Jesus Christ working through Everything is why I am a Christian Reformed minister. The Christian Reformed Church emphasizes this message of God's kingdom. It emphasizes that, that there is not a square inch over all of creation over which God does not say mine. And immediately when, when I heard that, when I heard some of my teachers explaining that concept, I was like, you mean it's... it's it's more than just forgiveness of sins and coming to church every week and singing a couple of nice songs. Yes, it is. It's every square inch of your life being shaped by the gospel, by the gospel of God's grace and God's love, not only approaching us, but filling us. And so that second, that se that, that second parable of that yeast working its way through an entire batch. The message here, or the emphasis here, is uh, about the leavening effect of, of Jesus Christ and his people as, as we move out with our, all of our various skills. I'm, I'm a preacher. Some of you are accountants. Some of you are business people or were business people. Some of you cared for children at home. Some of you were teachers. And, and all of us, using our various gifts for the glory of God and for the building of his kingdom, become a, a leavening agent in our world, bringing the blessing of God and his love. In modest ways, yes. Sometimes it is modest, but that's okay. God uses our modest efforts, and he establishes his kingdom through those modest efforts. And in conclusion, we come to the last two parables of Jesus. The parable of someone finding a, a pearl of great value and someone else stumbling upon something of great value and then hiding it in the field. And, and the, the point of, of both of those parables is the same, that the kingdom of God is something that we should cherish, something that we should, again, uh, consider as, as something in, in high esteem, the highest of esteem, in fact. There is nothing that compares 
to the value of the kingdom of God. There is nothing that compares to the love that, 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 that enters into our lives when the kingdom of God is, is shared and spread. I came across a poem that I would like to read. And again, the image here in those parables are, is the image of an oyster, something of great value. Susan Wharton Gates writes, Spirit in the oyster shell, deviously hidden from view in black river mud by the maker who longs to greet the few, the few hungry enough, thirsty enough to fish it up and pry it apart that mournful, craggy shell, the oyster is God's humblest of vessels. A seemingly uninspired afterthought, pieced from nature's scrap, it is admittedly a hard shell, but tucked inside like the prize in a crackerjack box is the pearl. Heaven thrills when someone picks and pockets it. Pearl of great value hidden away in a vessel that can only be described as ugly. I think of myself, myself when I think of that message. I think of my own history of brokenness. Each of us can think of our own histories of brokenness. And yet, when God through his grace comes to me, when God through his grace comes to you, he makes us into something of great value. The message of scripture, again, is consistently this, this message of, of Jesus Christ looking at his world and looking at us, his people, and seeing the value behind the hard shell, the value that he was willing to sacrifice his life for, the thing that he was willing to give everything for. As we think about these messages, the message of the mustard seed in its smallness, the message of yeast as it works through the batch of dough, the message of those who find the kingdom of God or find the pearl of great value and are, are willing to give everything for it, we are reminded again of that same message. We are the hands and the feet and the, and the voice of Jesus Christ sharing his love, showing his love in the communities in which we find ourselves. We do not despise small beginnings. We trust that God can work through our humble efforts and bring about his goodness and his grace. Amen. I'd like us to respond to this word of God and sing together, I want to walk as a child of the light. I want to follow Jesus.
As an affirmation of our faith, we recite together the words of Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer number 86. I will ask the question, and together we will recite the answer. Since we have been delivered from our misery through Jesus, by grace through, through Jesus Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image. So that he may be praised through us, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. We come now before God in this time of prayer for our world and for the people of our community. Are there any prayer requests that you have that we can lay before God this evening? I was asked to announce that Dirk Strunks, who I believe his name is in the bulletin under the prayer section, has returned home, and so we are grateful for that. Dirk Strunks. Anyone else have a prayer request, a joy, or a concern that uh, we can lay before and bring before God together this evening? Yes, Mrs. Mann. Mary Versteeg might come home this week. That is such good news. She's been there for quite some time. Um, so we are grateful for that. Yes, Dorothy. Yes, that was a, a, a prayer of, I, I do believe it comes from a deep place of concern. Most of us uh, are aware that Iran in an effort to retaliate because of a strike against one of their commanders sent a number of drones, hundreds and hundreds of drones, to attack Jerusalem. That was yesterday. And this is one of those destabilizing moments and events again in our prayer, again, is that uh, people's minds and hearts would be softened and people would come to the table and begin to talk with one another and that peace would reign. Yes, girl. What is your brother's name, Burl? All right. We will pl pray for Clifford. Um, for those who could not hear, Cl uh, Burl's brother Clifford is blind. Uh, his seeing eye dog has recently died, and of course that is uh, some, uh, something that he relies on. And so we will pray for Clifford. Uh, yes, from the back. I don't know your name. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. What is your mother's name, please? I, I, I visited your mother in the hospital. Okay. Our condolences to you. I don't know your name. Dina. Thank you, Dina. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Let us come before God now in prayer. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, 
in the prayer that you taught us to pray. First of all, we declare our love for you as the creator of heaven and earth. And then we come before you with our petitions for your kingdom to come and your will be to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is a prayer that you taught us so very many years and millennia ago and a prayer that we continue to utter today in the midst of a world where there is so much brokenness. We see that brokenness in places where there is unrest, where there is war. And just yesterday, we heard again an escalation in the war of the Middle East. And we do pray, Lord, that, that those who are in the midst of that, those who are leaders in the midst of that, would go to the table of conversation. And we pray, Lord, for peace to reign in an area where there has been so much unrest, where so many lives have been affected by, again, by the loss and tragic loss of life through war, but also through famine. And so we pray, Lord, for peace to reign in not only uh, Gaza and Israel and Iran, but also in Ukraine, between the Ukrainian people and, and Russia, we pray, Lord, for your kingdom to uh, come into our lives even in the midst of sorrow and suffering, in the midst of loss. And so I pray, Lord, for the DeMario family, for Dina, her da Ida's daughter. Surround her and the rest of the family with your comfort. May they know, too, that, that your grace holds Ida both in life and in death. We pray, Lord, for Clifford. We give you thanks, Lord, for the community in which he finds himself, a community where he experiences so much support. We pray, Lord, for uh, a new seeing eye dog that will help him navigate in the, uh, in the world that he uh, is uh, thrust into darkness. We pray, Lord, for the Strunks, for Dirk, and for Mary Versteeg as they return home. And, and again, we are grateful for, for healing for both of them. And we ask, Lord, that again, as they make their way through each day, that they would be given glimpses of your goodness, that they would be given glimpses of your grace, of your kingdom that, again, holds them. We thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you that in this place we can be reminded, even in the midst of a world where there are so many competing voices for our attention, so many competing voices that call for our allegiance, that we can declare that you are our king, that our allegiance is to you, that you hold us and direct us. And so, Lord, hear our prayer this evening, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You are reminded that at the back of church today, the, there will be an offering that will be taken again. The first offering is for the church budget, the second for Thrive uh, Relationship Abuse Prevention. I'd invite you to now please stand for God's benediction and uh, the song of departure. Friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift his face towards you. May you know his peace, his wholeness, his shalom. And all God's people say, amen. Mm -hmm.